Hi everyone, welcome to episode 93 of the Access Noise Podcast. I'm Mark Miller, thanks for listening. In this episode, I talk to Fran Healy from Travis about their live shows in Derry and Belfast and the 21st anniversary of their classic album, The Invisible Band. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Alice Merton about her brand new album, Sides. When I put out my EP, that was kind of the one thing that took off so suddenly. And I felt like I didn't have any time to really put into the first album. Like I felt like I was being rushed because I was constantly on tour. Or I was doing promotion for, for the single and the EP. So seeing what can happen in the world and how quickly live music can be gone from one day to the next, I really had this kind of feeling of like, okay, well, anything can happen in the world. So I'm just going to make music that I love. And that gave me some kind of relief and satisfaction. So I, I felt more relaxed, actually. So check it out. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe and share it with your friends. If you want up-to-date music news, album reviews and interviews, then check out our main website at accessnoise.com. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Search for the tag at Access Noise Music. Here's Access Noise writer Daniel Lynch with a taste of what's been on the website this week. Lots of new music and gig announcements on the website this week. The Wedding Present will release a 30th anniversary reissue of the Hit Parade with a run of live shows between August and November. Gang of Youth will headline the Limelight in Belfast in November and we've got the new single from Orbital, which features Stephen Hawking. That's streaming now ahead of the release of their album 30 Something at the end of July. Deaf Radio have shared their new video exclusively with XX Noise. You can watch and listen to Quicksand right now. That's the third single from their upcoming album. And we've had eyes and ears of recent gigs, including Social Distortion at the Academy in Dublin, Per Jam at Hyde Park and Midnight Oil at the Camden Roundhouse. All of that and more at accessnoise.com. Scottish rock band Travis are celebrating the 21st anniversary of their multi-platinum album The Invisible Band with live shows in the UK and Ireland. In this interview, Fran Healy talks about The Invisible Band, playing Derry for the first time, an attempted carjacking and lots more. So sit back, relax and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Fran Healy. Hi Fran, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Nice to be here. Nice to have you. Uh, Travis are celebrating, the tw- I think it's the 21st anniversary of the Invisible Band with UK and Ireland shows. Can you believe it's been that long since the album was released? In some ways, yes. In other ways, totally not. Like The album itself has aged remarkably well in 21 years. It still feels kind of fresh. And in other ways, there's so much that's happened to us as, as people, you know, like we're, we're parents or we've got kids now who are like 16 years old and it's all that stuff has happened in the meantime. And then you, you come back and you play these songs and they're very, very, they've stood up to the test of time really well. Yeah, they absolutely have. Um, as we speak, this week you play uh, shows in the Millennium Forum in Derry and Belfast Waterfront. How mm-hmm. much are you looking forward to those shows? Well, we haven't been over there for a long time I believe the um, I think we, well there's quite a, a memorable gig we had there where someone threw knickers on the stage <laughs> in Belfast? Um, yeah we've never had knickers thrown on the stage only in Belfast <laughs> <laughs> they were very small knickers as well so it was well dodgy <laughs> <laughs> and I took the knickers like, and I, they landed on our monitor my monitor and I picked them up by my fingertips and I like wheezed them across the stage and they landed on them. They landed on the guitar tech and then he threw them onto the monitor guy. It was very funny. <laughs> well, uh, maybe that person will be there uh, on, on Friday night in Belfast. You never know. With decidedly larger knickers, hopefully. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's unusual for a band to play both Belfast and Derry on the same tour. So have Travis ever played in Derry before? No, we haven't. And um, and we're 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 um, hold on, something's something's playing on my something's playing on my um, 
my iPhone. I don't know why. Some music was playing, mysterious music in the background. Um, I don't know actually. We we um, here's the thing. Like we always say, like we want to go here, 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 and there, and no one really ever listens to us. Um, it's always the agents and the managers who are the people who sort of organize all these things. It's in the end, uh, you know, this is like in the early days. You're like, oh, I want to do this. And in the end, you just you, you eventually just sort of relent and you hope you'll end up in places that want you to play there. Um, so we're really looking forward to Derry. I mean, especially Derry if you've not been there before. Well, part of your family are from Northern Ireland. And so growing up, were you made aware of any sort of sayings or traditions uh, Northern Ireland and Northern Irish sayings or traditions, uh, or did you spend any time there when you were younger? So my family from from Enniskillen are on my father's side, and I wasn't really ever in touch with my father's side. Like my grandfather um, on my dad's side and my grandmother were both dead by the time I was born, and um, so all of that side of the family are, are kind of a mystery to me, which is unfortunate. But I think the thing is. Living in Glasgow, you know, like people, I was talking about this the other day, you know, people talk about being Scottish, you know, and, and this kind of idea of being Scottish. And um, I think um, there's Scottish and then there's Glaswegian. And the Glaswegians are um, they're kind of like a mixture between, um, they're a mixture between Northern Irish and Scottish. There's that blend of the two. And it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a, I, th- I I think it's a really nice, and because you get a bit of something, you know, and it makes it's bigger than the sum of its parts. So, but I, I, I never, I never got any idea of any of my family from over there. All I know is that that's where we're from. Yeah, and then there's the Ranger Celtic thing. I think you're the only Celtic fan and and a band full of Rangers fans. I'm the only Celtic fan. I mean, I connected all of that with just getting a doing at school. I used to get beaten up. I mean, when I was from about primary three to it was about a year and a half, I would get beaten up almost daily because of <laughs> just because of, you know because of what team you supported or what what religion you you, you sort of your your parents were and um and in the end it put me off religion and it put me off football <laughs> <laughs> and it put me off getting getting beaten up funnily enough. <laughs> On this tour, when you're when you're playing uh, the Invisible Band, do you, do you play it in the same running order as the album with hits at the end? What, what can fans expect? Right. So the we I've been to a couple of these with other bands, and I love them because it's like you know it's like you're putting the the needle on the record, and you just like, and it's like the band walk into your room and start playing the album, and uh, we're doing it pretty much. Um, Exactly the way it sounds on the record, and it's um, it's a really really good um, uh, balance of a, a record. Actually, better than the man who was. We went out with that a couple of years ago, um, but this one really spreads really nice. And um, and then we go off, and then we come back on, and then we play a bunch of other songs that everyone knows. And um, that's a really good show. We 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 ran with fourteen of them in um, up and down Britain uh, in May. And it was magic. Is there an album by a band that you would like to see performed in, in its entirety? That's a good question. Um, hmm. Alive or Dead? Yeah. Um, I would love to see Bowie doing Hunky Dory or maybe the Beatles doing um, Robber Solar Revolver. Yeah. We got, you know, did you see the thing on, on, on the Beatles Get Back? Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's just, that, it's, that's just, just sitting with them for nine hours, watching them, and it's so offhand. That that's that's the closest I think anyone will get to something as cool as that. It's a great, it's a great documentary, and and it never gets boring. No, uh, some people say it does though, but they're idiots. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> Fran, you're a fantastic songwriter. So were David Bowie, oh. Paul McCartney, John Lennon, Morrissey, and Noel Gallagher. The thing. Mm-hmm. You have in common with them. You have Irish roots. Do you think there's something in that? <laughs> yes, absolutely. But I think the thing, I think the thing, the key thing is storytelling. And we, uh, the Celts are a very, very, um, we, are, are, we have a 
we're, and we're old people as well. I was in a, I was in a, um, a plate, a, like getting a burger or something um, a while ago, and it was in America. And the woman gave me my burger, and she, and I was like, oh, thanks very much. And she's like, oh, she's like, that's an old, that's an old accent. And I had never heard it put like that before. But the thing is, our accents. The reason why we speak like this and you know, we have these cool accents is that they're old. You know, we're an old people, and old people, as in people, <laughs> the bigger words, people <laughs> have. We'll always have these these um, these traditions, like storytelling. The, the the Norse, um, all the people from Norway and Sweden, they they are old people as well, and they've got all these ancient stories, and you know, they they talk their legs off a. You know the hind legs off a donkey if you let them. Um, so we're good at telling stories, and we want to tell stories. And I really think that storytelling doesn't necessarily have to be songs or books or poems. It could be all you know, all those things. It can be painting. It can be um, just down the pub talking to someone. And, um, doesn't have to be art even. Um, so it's it's in it's in our blood because we're I think because we're an old. We're old nations. We're old people. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I've, n- I've never heard it put it that way before. Yeah, I agree with that totally. Uh, Travis gained huge success with your second album, The Man Who, in 1999. It spent nine weeks at number one on the UK albums charts and it really put you guys on the map. With that set success, did you feel pressure going in to record The Invisible Band? Did you worry about it? Not at all. We were, uh, on the contrary, we were just like, oh my God. It's like we just had won the pools and we were like, oh my God, we can get to go to any studio we want to. We've got a brilliant producer. We went into this amazing place called Ocean Way. But the pressure for you know, like writing songs, also that was off because, uh, sorry, the pressure to make a better album because it's like, I didn't, with The Man Who, we didn't try, and we weren't trying to, well, I don't know how to put it, we weren't trying to make a record that was we're just trying to make a good record, and that's all you can do. So that pressure, I think, uh, supersedes all the other pressure because it's that's all you can do. Um, and it's when when a band gets a, a big album or a big hit, you realise unless you're an idiot. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the constant in this interview. You realise. I day. mean, there's another there's another word that we use in Travis, but we won't say it because it's rude. You realise... Say what you want, that's not the BBC, you know. It's a no, no, I, w- I won't say it, because it's just, you know, I just won't say it. <laughs> You'll be cancelled? Um, yeah, no, no, I would definitely not be cancelled. I'll probably be held up. Um, no, but you're, if, you, if, you, um, if, you, if you get big, if you're in a band and you get big, um, and you think uh, it's something to do with you, then you're an idiot. It's, it's luck. You're... you're gust of wind that that hits maybe two or three things a year and that's just totally arbitrary i mean you've got to like go with the luck and let it you know like and sail along with it and so for us we were like into the into the studio and um just having a laugh and and um we had such a good time making that record the first couple of weeks were a bit scary because nigel was our producer was in a bit of a mood because he'd just been working with radiohead <laughs> Nigel, Nigel Godrich. Yeah, but no, he he just come out from um, in in all seriousness. He just come out from I think doing oh, oh no uh, Kitty, and so he went from that straight into working with us, which is like jumping from boiling water to ice cold water. Very opposite bands, um, very different types of people, and I think he took a second to adjust, and then we were just like a little bit like oh my god, just going to work out. Um, in the end, it worked out great, and you know, here we are. Yeah, the Invisible ba- Band went on to be as successful as the Man Who, with hits singles such as "Sign Side" and "Flowers in the Window." So, mm-hmm. how did it feel when the, when it was successful and, the, and those tracks were all over the radio? Oh, it was that was that was a bit of a mad year actually, because like we were so we brought out the album in, in the UK and Europe, and that was going great, and then we came, came over to America with it, and it was just about to go. And then nine eleven happened, and everything just just went and hit the hit the deck. And then we, I think, around September or November, our bands kind of 
decided, like, we're going to have a break. We were burnt out. And then, um, so we had some time off and then we came back for some festivals in the new year, which was two, what would have been 2001, maybe? And um, yeah, 2001. And we had four gigs to do, one in Iceland, one in France, and two Virgin Festivals headlining them. Uh, we did the one in Iceland, which was amazing. This is around about June 2001, at the end of the run of the Invisible Band. And then we did France, and then Neil broke his neck that night. That's right. And, that, and then it was like almost like a forced pause, you know, like stop, take stock of your life, take stock of your um, what's important. And um, and we did. And um, I'm happy to say we we chose life. Yeah, and some bands would have got on a replacement drummer. No, I know. I I think I mean even the Beatles brought in replacement um, back in the day. Um, but uh, we, we the reason why we didn't was I, I remembered um, when Neil had his first kid. Uh, we we brought in a replacement drummer. We we were on tour with Oasis, and so we brought in this young kid called Bo, and uh, he um, I think he was from Manchester. And he played with us for about two weeks. Then Neil came back. And I remember just how difficult Neil found it. So when it came to that, and he he was like, he almost died. And I thought, how would that be for him just to think that he was so d- disposable, like to be replaced by some other drummer? And I, so we all decided, you know, in, in, um, with a view to making the quickest recovery possible, we just could not do it. Your highest charting single from, from the Invisible Band was Sing. It hit no, number three. The song yeah. was brilliant and the video was too. It's a mad <laughs> it's a mad dinner party, throwing food around. There's a monkey. You have a David Beckham haircut. How much fun did you have making the video? It was amazing. Really fun. Um, the uh, the director and artists were, um, were great. And they, they, it was their idea. They're like, why don't we have this big giant food fight? And we were like, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Funny thing was the better version of it because we went on top of the pops when we brought that out and um, we asked them, "Look, can we recreate the food fight on on stage?" And they agreed to it, and we um, and we had a proper, like a real life <laughs> cream pie food fight um, on on top. But I think it's on the internet; it's on YouTube. If you look it up, it's very funny. So, who had the hairstyle first? You or David Bagger? <clears throat> oh, me, absolutely. I am. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I had that thing. I remember we we met him. <clears throat> Me and Nora went to see um, what was it? Um, went to Toys R Us for something. We were walking uh, out in Wembley at Toys R Us, and we were walking through the car park. I had my mohawk and looking all like pop starry, and then to walking towards us with a giant trolley full of toys was um, Posh and Beck. And we just sat and just chatted to them for five minutes. I'd never met them before. And we're like, hey, and obviously he knew who we were and I knew who he was. So we were just like, blah, blah, blah. And then two weeks later, he had he had the cut and made it famous. Your songs and melodies have an amazing way of becoming earworms. Since I've been preparing this, I've listened to a lot of your songs and can't get them out of my head. Especially, oh, especially sing. How does that make you feel when people tell you that? Do you think, job done? Yeah, I, I read this thing today. It was Kurt Vonnegut who said it was a quote somewhere. I don't know if it is him that said it. You know, some people say quotes and it's not other people. But it's a good quote and it said something along the lines of if you're an artist, you really your 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 only job is just to make somebody smile. Like just give a little bit of pleasure, just take the edge off of things. So music's the closest thing I think we've got in the world to magic. It can can turn people's lives around. It can bring people back from the edge of dementia. Like, have you seen those things where old people, where they, eat, they put headphones on them yeah. and they, they're catatonic and then they suddenly come alive? I mean, there's yeah. nothing that can do that. They've got scientists spending years trying to figure out drugs that can do that to the brain when, you know, if you play my, someone of a certain age in a hospice somewhere, it has more effect than any amount of drugs. So I think we don't even know, we don't understand how powerful music is. And, a, and, um, but it's powerful. And so to be a, someone delivering that and be a part of that big 
um, story is, is, is really good. Yeah. Sing just keep, keeps on coming into my head, just random. Nah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't listened to the album since last week, you know, but I don't know, I can't explain it. I'm so glad I didn't write Barbie Girl. <laughs> but I think you should do it in uh, Belfast on <laughs> Friday night. Or Derry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now that you mention it. <laughs> Looking at the track list on The Invisible Band, it's full of classics. What songs on the album mean most to you? Good question. Um, the Cage. And I remember I was in New York on the phone with a mate and... Um, he he was in a band called Remy Zero. He's a singer. And we were chatting. We had a, a lovely chat. We were on the phone for a bit. And at the end of it, we were talking about songwriting. And I was like, right, can you see your guitar? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, right, I'm looking at my guitar. When we put down the phone, I'm going to go and write a song. And you go and write a song. And he's like, right, deal. And we put the phone down. And I went straight to my guitar. And I wrote The Cage. And, uh, and he didn't. <laughs> I came back to him like, the next day, I was like, so? And he's like, oh, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't write, you know, he didn't do it. And, uh, and I played him the cage, and he's like, holy shit. So that, that is important to me, that song. Um, Flowers in the Wind is very important. Sing. Um, Last Train is really cool. They're all really, like, the thing that's it's hard, it's, the thing about our band that's quite different from a lot of bands is that it, Almost every single song, I would say ninety-eight percent of our songs are about something. You know, they're, they've never been written. That's why it takes a while to collect songs for a record because you write them about your life. You know, if something's going on, you use the song to um, help you. It's like therapy, and um, and that's why you know when people when other people hear the song, it helps them too because. It speaks to whatever they're going through as well. Um, so songs are important in a way. Um, I think the question would be what song's not important. Um, Follow the Light is not really that important to me. I don't know. Just It felt like it was like a record company was like trying to squeeze a song out and that song came out prematurely. The melody needed a little bit more time to to um, in the womb. Um and do you, play, do, you, do you play it differently live? It's funny because live it's a bit more because it's it's had time to grow. It's it's got a bit more um, something to it, but it's still it's still um, it's still not a song that I feel I feel that song songs need to sometimes incubate for a bit longer. And our record company were just like, we need more songs, we need more songs. So we ended up that came out too soon from wherever they come from. In music, there's always an anniversary. So <laughs> it's 23 years since you released Why Does It Always Rain On Me, which gave the band huge mainstream success. It's the kind of song where fans would rat if you didn't play it. So <laughs> why, do you, why do you think that they're struck a chord? Um, because it's about having bad luck, isn't it? Yeah. It sounds like a song about, like, why, like, it's like when you're standing at the bus stop and the bird shits on you or when, you, or when you're walking down the street and the... the the, the the truck goes through the puddle and it like stokes you or when you you're walking at your house and the door just clicks shut and you go oh fuck and you forget your keys and you can't get in and you have to break into your own house it's that kind of thing it speaks to that even though it's it wasn't it was lit, it was very literal it was like I was on holiday and it was raining and I just I just was fed up and I'm on, I just was trying to cheer myself up but it speaks to that sort of universal feeling. Um, that's probably why it's, it's and it's and it's got a really good melody. Yeah. Sounds like kind of proper. It sounds like a classic song. I remember our producer Mike Hedges when he heard it. He's like, "That's that's going to be a hit." And I was like, "I had no idea. I thought it's a good song, but I didn't think it would be too much." Well, I read on Twitter recently. Uh, you put on your your Twitter that you had a bit of bad luck. You were the victim of an attempted carjacking in LA. Oh, yeah. What happened there? That sounds mad. Um, I was coming into my studio and I, this guy walked up to my car. He was like, it's, it's like a gated place. And um, I went in and this guy who I thought was a security guard came up. Big dude. Really big guy. And I rolled my window down. I was like, hey man, how you doing? And he, and he's, and he immediately starts like trying to get into my car. 
he's like, let me in the fucking car. And I was like, whoa. And he's all like huge guy grabbing me, like, like trying to find the, the, the door handle and he couldn't. And then grabbing me and trying to pull me out the window. And then um, I'm like hooking him in the face. But it was like, like flies on a windscreen on your car in the doorway, you know what I mean? You didn't even feel it. Um, and he went, he, he sort of stopped and he went in the back window was open as well. And he was trying to open that door and, um, and he didn't get in and I managed to lock the windows and drive off. And I was thinking to myself after it, why didn't I just drive away? <laughs> I just driven away. Yeah. AIDS. <laughs> and I was talking to a friend and we were talking about fight, flight or freeze. And I'm fight. That's my thing. I don't, you know, that's I think a, it's. That's a Glasgow in you. Probably, probably the kill in me. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't, and it, like, oh, if I drive away, I'll probably break his arm. It was, no, I'm staying here. Weird, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you, you got away unscathed. Yeah, I was, while it was happening, because it was all happening in a kind of weird, that weird slow motion type of way. And I'm like punching him and he's grabbing me and he's pulling me out. And I'm like, there's certain thoughts that pop into your head in that slow motion moment. Like, does he have a knife? Is he got, you know, and in LA, is he armed? Does he have a gun? Because more than, more than always, they'll have, they'll have a weapon in LA. And, um, so I was, I was like, oh, damn. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's happened. It's been the third thing that's happened over the space of about a year. That's, that's, um, people have like have come close to getting getting beaten up, or and that never happened in in the UK. It never happened in um, Berlin when I went there for mm-hmm. ten years. So I'm I'm a bit like I think I'm that's three times, and I'm I'm beginning to think maybe maybe we should be living somewhere else. It's a bit safer. Yeah, absolutely. If you were to recommend one of your albums to someone who had never heard Travis before. What album would you tell them to start with? Oh wow! Well, to start with, oh, yeah. um, probably the man who, um, because that's kind of, I'd say that was where I, we, like, we all kind of got into a sort of zone, and we were like, all right, this is where our playing was up to a certain standard, standard. The the songwriting was at a certain standard. And um, the production was just everything just like coalesced. It's a, it's a good, it's, and it's a good example of like, um, I think everybody goes on about how songs have to be upbeat, you know, have to be an upbeat song to be like, um, that, that's not, that's not, um, it doesn't have to be that way. And that, that album proves it. Um, lots of really good songs. And, um, and I would say then, then, to play Good Feeling, our first album after that, just as a second to show the other side of us, because we've we've got, as Noel Gallagher called it, we've got inner inner um, inner Slade. Yeah, he was a big fan of that album, wasn't he? Oh yeah, it's, it's I listened to it because we had to we, we put out all the things on vinyl, so I had to listen to it, and um, it's some um, it's an amazing record. This the energy on it's like, and it's like we. Travis released that um, really sort of in the middle of Britpop, and it's so American sounding, and it's so it's so different from um, everything else at the time. And I think this is something that's overlooked with our band, just because we're not. Maybe it's because we're Scottish and we don't blow our own trumpets, and we don't brag. But um, at the at the risk of bragging, I think it's something that we don't talk enough about. Like Travis, is very much like. We're very unorthodox. Like we became orthodox with the man who, when we became mainstream, when that sound became mainstream. But even we changed. We went to Twelve Memories, then we went to Ode to Jay Smith, The Boy with No Name. We we change every album, every song, you know, just like collections of songs. Anyway, so we we've done lots of different things, but I think the the root, the most important thing with us is the song. And the song leads the production and it leads everything. Absolutely. And Travis have achieved incredible success since you formed in Glasgow in 1990. So, so looking back, what stands out to you? What, what's been your highlights? 
I think um, the, the headlining, um, first of all, headlining Tina Park, huge. Headlining Glastonbury um, on a Saturday night on the Pyramid stage. It's like, that's insane. Um, the Kendrick Lamar headlined Glastonbury in the Pyramid stage this year. And that's kind of, um, it's a huge gig. Uh, that, so that's a good one. Uh, it's, um, I think, getting an Ivor Novello Award for songwriting. That was good. I think, but the most important thing of all is that we re- remain together. We're, we're still the same band. So like we were talking earlier on about replacing members of groups, you know, bands are never, it's not just put someone else in. I mean, you could call it, I think you become a brand, not a band, when you replace members and you just, you know, you keep that thing over your, I think you should always change the name of the band if you change members. Anyway, but we um, that's I think what I'm most proud of is that we're we're all still together and we're still happily together, we're still friends. Yeah, there's not many bands that stay together with the same lineup for any length of time mm-hmm. these days. You well, know. there's not many bands these days. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you two probably hold a record of staying yeah. together for that length of time. That's true. The last album you released was ten songs in 2020. Are there mm-hmm. any plans for a new album once the tour's over? Yeah, we're going to hopefully try and go into the studio at the end of the year. Um, I started writing. I've got a few songs. Um, so we're just, it's again, it's song dependent. So we're sort of looking around just now, maybe doing that. But we, we're going to get this little run of shows out of the way and then hit the ground running like as far as songwriting goes and see if we can get a record out. Probably, if, if we do get into the studio now, at the end of the year, it's a record. Either this side of summer next year or the other side of summer. If you know what I mean? Yeah. August or September next year. Just a few more. I like mm-hmm. to ask my guests the following questions. Where and how do you consume music? I always listen to music on headphones, although recently I've started listening to it a little bit more on speaker in the house. Um, I just love head listening to things on headphones because I can hear everything. Um, and uh, I have these really amazing headphones by a company called Flare that you can hear. You can listen to a record that you you thought you knew, and then you you can hear things that you never heard before with these. They've got I don't know how they do it, but um, so I I. I I listen. I love listening to stuff on headphones and where, wherever. I an interesting thing with me is I'm not a voracious listener of music, although I love it. I my preferred state is silence. <laughs> <laughs> I just you know I, I I like quiet. I'm not a big game, um, and unless unless you're um, I think I listened to a lot when I was um like a teenager and in my 20s listened to an awful lot had a lot of catching up to do because I didn't have a record player until I was kind of like in my teens but yeah when you're when you're writing the songs with that in mind when, when you're in the studio uh, and you're recording your, your your songs or your album are you thinking about that about somebody you know trying to get the sounds in that for for people who maybe are listening on headphones you know get these wee sounds in oh, that yeah. you wouldn't hear um, oh no, but the, uh, right. So the thing about the sounds that you wouldn't hear is like things like people talking in the background. You can hear things like yeah. someone, yeah, you can hear someone dropping something in the back, or you can hear on a fade out of some other song, someone saying something that you never heard before. Um, but we we don't deliberately do that. But sometimes those things just kind of creep their way in. Um, there's a there's always like takes of stuff that that are funny like we were where we start laughing um for someone says something or does something and then we can't stop laughing so we obviously can't put that on the record but there's all these outtakes that i'm sure will find their way out there one day out of all the music in your collection which artist or band do you have the most albums by probably the beatles and Joni mitchell actually no Joni mitchell i've got more albums by Joni than by the beatles well, I know the Beatles, but uh, Joni Mitchell isn't somebody I've really dealt with. What album would you recommend for me to start with? Uh, I would do um, 
Hmm. Probably blue. Blue is uh, is it's like a songbook. One of the most amazing records um, that anyone's ever released. It's just her, very very minimal um, instrumentation, and these melodies uh, are are just um, incredible. And then obviously there's there's just loads of of, of Joni albums that because she. Cause she as well, she went into all these different um, styles of music, but blue is definitely one you should check out first. Well, I am aware of blue, but I've never, never heard it, so I definitely will. You've never heard blue? Well, I'm I'm sure I've heard songs in the background somewhere, but I've yeah. never actually sat down. Right. And, and, Get the headphones on. And, and and, 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 mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I will. I definitely will. That's why I asked this this question because I discovered lots of new music. Mm-hmm. Um, last one, Fran. Yeah. Which song or album is your guilty pleasure? You did mention Barbie Girl. Well, funnily enough, recently I have been, and it's like with Olivia Newton John passing away yesterday. Yeah, very funny. Um, I have been, I, but a month ago I'd started listening to Grease. Brilliant again. soundtrack. Brilliant. Yeah, and, 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 but, and in the car, I mean, literally belting it out. At the, and I can sing loud, belting it out at the top of my voice, and um, it's good. And then really sad that she's passed away. She's she's a great singer and beautiful as well. Yeah, hopelessly devoted to you. What a song! Oh, I know, I know. That, that, that whole some of the songs on on that album, well, from a musician's point of view, like playing on it, um, like um, Greece is the word. The, the theme song, who they got to sing the songs, it's a, it's really really cool. Yeah, yeah, no, I love it. It's, it's one of those albums that's always been there, you know, in, yeah. in my life, you know. But I don't really like to tell every. I, w- I wouldn't drive down the road blasting it out of my car with the windows down. Exactly, but, exactly. That's why I mentioned guilty pleasure. But then again, it wasn't guilty because I didn't feel that guilty. But I did not open my windows. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a guilty pleasure, yeah. Yeah. Fran, that's that's my question's finished. It's been fantastic cool. talking to you. Um Yeah, anyway. you too. So cool. uh yeah, all the best for the rest of the tour and uh look forward to your new music next year or the year after. Thanks so much for having me. Thank yeah, you. And I'll try and get sign out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> all right, mate, take it easy. Thank you. See you later. Bye bye. 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 bye.